Hello and welcome. Here we are in lecture eight. So we're gonna pick up where we were building the last few lectures. So remember the sequence we've been trying to learn more about how to build bigger, more sophisticated generators. And so remember last week we were talking about how to encapsulate them. And then on Monday we talked about how to use a decoupled interface that is ready, valid signaling to you know, give them a little bit more flexibility how to uh, communicate. And it's also kind of a very commonly used interface that's easy to convey things between modules. So you're taking that a step further. And so we're talking specifically about a thing called arbitration, but it's also a good example of a lot of uh, cases where we're gonna build a kind of little generated modules where we're gonna take the time to actually go down, you know, for, for collection of wires and figure out how we're gonna kind of wire things together wire by wire and see how we can build these things up, right? And so we're gonna build a variety of simple things. A lot of these things are actually already in the Chisel uh, util library, but uh, seeing how to construct them is still very instructive. And uh, we're gonna use, do this using the for loops and recursion we've covered so far. Uh, you can imagine how some of this is going to get made a lot cleaner and smoother when we cover functional programming next week. And so with that, uh, let's get started. So uh, in particular, we're talking about things called uh, one-hot encoding. So you may have already seen this in the digital design course, but we'll talk about why this would be helpful for us when we're building our chisel generators. Uh, priority encoders, this thing called arbiters, and finally we'll put it all together with an example crossbar. Uh, as an aside for today's slides, uh, trying to improve, right? Remember last time we had a little bit of an issue of uh, sometimes these longer code segments don't quite fit on the slides. So for today, there's some places where I tried to, you know, really big it to make sure it fits on the slide, and some it's not. And we'll see what we like better. If we like it for me to zoom out more, or if it's better to just have more slides. So please, maybe after today's class, uh, give a shout out in the lecture channel of the Slack. Let us know which we prefer, and I can try to make sure to do that for the remainder of the term. And then I'll kind of do a little bit of an A-B test this quarter. Where you can kind of, oh, sorry, this lecture, you can kind of see both variants. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, load stuff in. Neato, all right, and then let's start off with one-hot encoding. So, oh, that's too bad, actually. Uh, I made a figure for this and it's not here. Okay, so uh, for one-hot encoding, it's a way to represent a signal, right? So we're very familiar with, uh, you know, representing numbers in binary. We can do that in our sleep now. Uh, and so one-hot encoding is a little bit different, right? So one-hot uh, encoding is, even though it's technically in binary, it's effectively unary, right? Where in a one-hot encoding, the collection of wires, and exactly one wire is high, one wire is one, the rest are zero uh, at a given time. It needs to be exactly one. If your one-hot encoding goes to all zeros, that's not a one-hot encoding. That's some sort of invalid state. Uh, you know, if you have two ones, that's going to cause problems, right? So one-hot encoding means exactly one uh, wire is one. And uh, it says this is very helpful for some number of reasons. Because you'll find, as you're kind of building up your modules and you have a lot of internal components, uh, sometimes you don't want a fully encoded number. By encoded, I mean, you know, uh, express base two, you know, uh, like normal, because that's not what you want. What you want is actually to get a signal per component. And really what you want to do is you want to perhaps activate, select, choose a single component, right? You want to say, hey, you're the one that wants to do stuff. Everyone else uh, shouldn't be doing anything. So, for example, uh, a classic um, uh, example, uh, usage of this is actually within like a uh, register file, right? You can imagine in a register file on a CPU, uh, you have your registers. When you, you know, ret retire an instruction, perhaps you're only going to update one re uh, register, right? And so what you do is you fan out the uh, data you're going to write to all the registers. But for all the registers, except for the one you're writing, you have the write enable set to zero, so they don't change value. And then the one you are going to overwrite, you set the write enable to one and actually change it, right? And so that's a one hot encoding. That's not perfectly one hot because for register file, of course, it's valid to have zero writes happening, which would not be one hot. Um, another example of these one hot encodings is actually within an SRAM uh, memory. Uh, in that case, when you look at how they design it on the left side, uh, you have, you know, an address coming in, like I want to activate row, you know, 14, and actually it gets turned into only a single wire for the word line being turned on. And so actually in the memory design space, I often refer to this as a decoder because they're so used to dealing with parallel components, you know, all these wires in parallel that to them, uh, the one hot world is the one that makes sense. That's that's the real world. And uh, when you put it in like a you know a compact you know binary based two representation, that's kind of a uh, encoded form to them, right? So you often hear this called uh, a decoder. Um, in Chisel, it's referred to as a one hot encoding. And unfortunately, there's a bit of a wart in the library where for one hot, sometimes they use OH, sometimes they use the num numeral one and then H. That's kind of a uh, annoying inconsistency. Um, and so you'll find it's sometimes very easy to deal with these. You'll have a number sometimes encoded, and you're like, shoot, I wish that was one hot. That'd be much easier to deal with one hot. And a lot of times you also find that some things 
or actually originally produced one hot and it takes additional effort to make it not one hot. And so actually if things are produced and consumed as one hot, don't convert it, just leave it as is. And that's, that works out really well. Um, and so we'll see that there's you know, ways to transform it both directions. Okay, so let's implement our own one hot encoder. And so what do we want to do? So remember, given a, a uint, you know, some number of bits, that's what this inwidth is. And then we're going to turn that uh, into a one hot uh, output, right? And so first of all, the question is, well, how big is the output going to be? Well, if I have n bits coming in, or using that, you know, dense binary encoding, and I now turn it to one hot, I actually need two to the n bits to hold it, right? The output for one hot encoding, right? Because, you know, n bits in binary can hold two to the n things. Now I want to distinguish those, uh, you know, two to the n things with only one bit each. I'm going to need two to the n uh, wires, right? So one hot encoding, yes, it can uh, increase the number of wires, but, you know, often wires are cheap in a close range, and so this is totally fine. Um, so you can see here we have our in-width coming in, and we compute our out-width, and that way we can just use this value elsewhere. And so, okay, we have our in-width coming in, out-width going out. We're saying, okay, we know this code is going to behave if the in-width is zero, so let's make sure it's at least uh, one. Okay, and so I chose to do this with a recursive style, right? So here we have a helper function, and this helper function is going to iterate through all of the bits in the uh, output. So you see, right, we're starting off helper of zero, and then we uh, iterate through, and you can see the recursion here. We're gonna keep calling helper over and over again, and we're gonna keep going until uh, we reach, you know, the outwit, at which point we're gonna have this space case and we're gonna stop the recursion. Okay, so we're gonna run outwit times, and what are we doing in the recursion? Well, we are using the cat operator, that's to concatenate, that is to combine these two things together to make a single new signal uh, of two cool things here. What we have is a comparison of our input to the particular index we're working at, uh, and we're concatenating that with uh, the result of the recursive call. So uh, you can imagine what's going to happen. Well, for, uh, you know, out with iterations, this helper function is going to get called in this recursive loop. And so, that's, you know, out with times we're going to call cat and we're going to count all these things together. So we're kind of putting this together bit by bit. Um, you can imagine, uh, for those of you who are already familiar with functional programming, this might be a little smoother being able to use things like map, and that's what's be nice to do this again next week. But even with uh, you know, a recursive function, we still get the idea here. So the idea is you know, we're going to have a cascading sequence of cat operators, right? At the lowest level, we're going to say, hey, uh, is this input equal to zero, for example, right? Uh, if it is, that lowest bit is going to be set to one, and that's going to be true, right? And we know because you know, all of these uh, comparators put in these cat operators are going to be unique indices, right? Because of that, you know, only one's going to be hot, right? And then you know, that's going to be concatenated into uh, the one comparing, is it equal to one or not, or is it equal to two or not? So you can see it's kind of builds this nice cascading chain going up. Um, so here's our little thing set up. Uh, we put in a, a little print statement here to help it uh, uh, keep track of it. Um, and this is, of course, the uh, chisel library way of doing it, so we can make sure we're not getting this wrong. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this. Maybe if I can just remove these extra lines, I can get a little bit more space. Okay, so we're going to try with a two-bit input in the uint space, right? So it's going to be two to the two or four for the one hot out, uh, output, right? And what are we going to do? We're going to try just all of the encodings, right? So we're putting in, uh, you know, io.in. We're seeing what, what it comes out is out. And we're, in this case, I chose to do, you know, a uh, decimal for the input and binary for the output to kind of see what's going on. You can see, okay, yes, zero turns on the lowest bit, one turns on the second lowest bit, two turns on the third lowest bit, etc. This is one thing you're going to see today a few times. It's a little bit annoying. Uh, there's kind of an implicit call to clock step and printf. And so uh, when you don't call clock step like this, it's going to not print anything. But then if you use clock that step and printf like I'm doing here, you're going to get this often uh, additional you know, bonus invocation with a zero input. Um, it's not ideal. Uh, but this is me using the printfs uh, inside the module. Sometimes the module is easier to kind of grab on what you want to rather than use a peek on the outside. OK, so. Uh, Functionally, I think this makes sense, but let's take a moment to kind of appreciate what we're doing, right? So like I said, we are constructing this together, right? So we are using this loop to uh, build up this design graph, you know, at the elaboration time, it's going to have n, sorry, out with a number of these concatenation operations, right? Um, so some people might be worried, well, wait, is that 
necessarily, you know, uh, maximally efficient, perhaps, perhaps not. Uh, my advice for this class and in design in general is get it working first. And then when you know it's a resource problem, then we're about optimizing it. Um, you can imagine, like, you can also start to analyze these things in terms of complexity, right? Like, you know, how does the logic depth or resource usage grow in terms of the input sizes, right? Um, and in this case, it's actually growing exponentially, right? So if I have an n-bit input, my output is growing, uh, you know, two to the end, right? So that's 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 pretty expensive. But you know, hopefully this conversion, you know, is not for a super big number. Perhaps you're going from like a four-bit number to, you know, now a uh, sixteen-bit one-hot encoding. Hopefully you're not going from a dense number to like, you know, uh, sixteen thousand-bit one-hot encoding. And uh, just to kind of show how convenient the chisel one is built into the util, you can see it right there. It's you know. <laughs> Uh, reasonably named, you went to one hot, you give it the thing, and it does it, right? And this isn't even a module. This is one of those, you know, uh, functions that just other thing internally without needing to call anything. Uh, cool. I'm going to pause if there's any questions so far. Okay. Well, let's keep going. So uh, that's... You know, we implemented our own one hot encoder. We also had access to one uh, from the Chisel standard library. Neat. Uh, let's keep going. So uh, another type of encoding is something referred to as a priority encoder, right? So once again, we're going to have a collection of wires. In the case of the one hot encoding, we said, okay, collection of wires, exactly one is hot. In the priority encoder, the inputs, multiple wires can be one, right? There's no such constraint. It could be a regular... So it's kind of this collection of, you know, individual binary signals. And what we want to find is the, you know, highest priority one. So here I use terminology consistent with uh, the Chisel Standard Libraries. Technically, Chisel Standard Libraries version of priority encoder finds the least significant bit that is one. So you imagine, like, you know, your list of signals as, you know, a uint number. It's the lowest uh, one, right? And whether it's the lowest or highest, it's something you just need to know when you make your design, but otherwise it's fine. Um, it's just important thing is there's a static priority, right? And so uh, why is it helpful with a static priority? Well, there's some things where you want to kind of know who wins a certain situation and you want to have a certain pecking order, right? And uh, like I said, it's helpful when you have logic just choosing between things. And so, for example, using another CPU example, if you have a pipeline processor and you're worried about resolving a read after write hazard or raw hazard, remember need to, you can use forwarding to get the data we need, right? And we forward that data um, we want to get the most recent producer of that data, right? If there's multiple instructions right into register we need, we want to forward from the most recent one. So that's the example of the priority that comes into this. Or perhaps you have a collection of things, maybe a bunch of registers you want to write to, and you need to pick one of them. And so maybe just for have something consistent, you say, hey, find me the first free or empty register, and you can use a priority encoder for that. Um, and so Chisel provides actually three different types of priority encoder-based uh, helper functions or uh, you know objects. Uh, so priority encoder, you give it a collection of these signals and it gives you back a, you know, compact, you know, binary index. Alternatively, you can give it uh, priority encoder one hot OH and it'll give you a one hot result. Uh, and alternatively still, it actually can combine the result of the priority encoder into a MUX, right? So in other words, what you're going to say is, hey, here are the n things I need. Here are the n bits representing the status of these things. Uh, put those into uh, a MUX, and then based on the priority ordering, you know, which in this case is based on the order in the uh, fields they are, you're going to get the output right away. So it's kind of nice, right? Um, a question you might have for a priority encoder is, okay, well, I can understand there's multiple bits. I picked the highest priority one. How rest the fine for a particular usage scenario? What happens if they're all zero? Not really a standard convention on that. Uh, in a Chisel YouTube library, it's actually not great. Um, <laughs> In that sense, because uh, it can, depending on which one you're using, if you're using the uh, if you're using the uh, index-based one, the regular priority encoder, you get the maximum index. Uh, if you are doing the uh, one-hot one, you get a zero. Uh, you'll see later at the end of today's lecture when we use a priority encoder and we want to handle a scenario in which they're all zeros. We actually test for, test for that separately. So uh, we test for that separately, and we see are any of the inputs one? You know, it's kind of or them all together. And with that, we kind of take action. And if they're all zero, we're kind of at that point aren't even looking at the output of priority code. That's part of why this little detail isn't so bad is because uh, you're kind of probably perhaps on some auxiliary mechanism making sure you're aware if at least one of them is high. Okay, so for the priority encoder, we're going to implement it two different ways using our re recursion. 
Uh, so one uh, is the one on the left. I drew the gates, not as gates, but as, you know, just wires being concatenated uh, together. Uh, and the reason why is um, uh, these gates get really big really fast. So you can see that uh, these are basically AND gates. So the lowest bit is going to be just is in one. Uh, sorry, is the lowest bit one? If it is, then in the lowest bit in this output is going to be one, and that's it, right? Now, uh, if it's not one, so the rest of these terms are going to have a not in zero on them, and they're, they're ended. These are, you know, uh, min, uh, min terms, like we learned about um, uh, in uh, 100. Um, then uh, we're going to go forward that, right? So, okay, so if the bit one is high and bit zero is low, then bit one is going to be the highest priority, right? Because if bit one is high, it basically, you know, outranks everything but bit zero. So if, it's high, if bit zero is high, it's going to win. And we don't need to bother putting anything on this. So you can see by the end, we have a, you know, n input and gate, which uh, understandably the CAD tools probably can't do for significant values of n. But what they're going to do automatically for you is they're going to turn down to a tree of and gates to kind of make that a more reasonable size and gates. But as you can see, the result is that, you know, a priority coder done this way, you have quite a few AND gates. Uh, alternatively, maybe another way to capture this precedence is to uh, think of it as a, but a bunch of muxes that are cascaded, right? So uh, no matter what comes in here, if IO in uh, zero is one, you know, this is high, uh, the output is going to be one. Meaning, you know, yes, the lowest bit is the priority winner in this case. Uh, you know, and likewise, if it's zero, then we look at the next mux and say, hey, what is it? And we can go ahead and look at that. Uh, and you can see this goes all the way back. And once again, uh, there's going to be uh, n terms, right? So just two different ways of doing it. And we're going to see this on the next slide. Uh, OK, so let's look at our code for this. Uh, so here we have, uh, you know, I'm making a little module to hold our priority encoder. So we're taking in, uh, you know, some number of bits as a uint. Uh, I didn't declare the output width because it's going to be helpful to kind of try a few things out here. And actually define helper functions, depending on which way we're doing this, right? So if we're doing with gates, as we described, uh, what are we doing? We're concatenating uh, these AND gates. Now, there's one little wrinkle here, right? If you go back to the prior slide, oops, didn't mean to modify this. Uh, you can see these AND gates are kind of building off the prior thing, right? So uh, this one's the base case, right? But this one is not of the prior one. Uh, this one's going to be, you know, like the next one's going to be, you know, io.in2 and not io.in1 and not io.in0. So you actually want to kind of pass along those terms. And so that's why in the next slide, you can kind of see there's this uh, field in our helper function expressor, express, you know, or short for expression, where we're going to keep kind of adding things onto it, right? So we're going to keep uh, ending things onto it as they build that up, right? Um, and uh, what are we concatenating? Well, the particular gate for our particular bit, as well as calling, you know, this helper function again. Uh, and this time we're kind of, you know, conveying, hey, we're, this is what we're building up with these gates. And uh, like the prior one, we're going to, uh, you know, keep building up and go from there. Uh, okay. And then let's go ahead and run this. Maybe we'll do the Verilog first. And I'm worried we're going to uh, run out of space. So we'll see how this goes. Yeah, so maybe we'll do this one as a, as a zoom. Let's try this one as a zoom. Uh, okay, uh, great. So maybe it prints out better if I don't have a print statement in there. Yes, it does. Alrighty, so uh, what do we want to do? We're asking for a priority encoder of just two bits, right? So it's taking uh, two bits inputs and two bits of output, right? And so what's it going to be? Well, it's going to be, uh, first, the lowest bit is just it directly, right? If that zero, if that lowest bit is one, that wins, right? And what's the highest bit going to be? Well, it's going to be uh, and not this underscore t1. And uh, sorry, it's going to be and t1, and t one's not that. So if uh, n zero is one, this is, of course, going to be zero. And this is going to get forced to zero. So we're going to get zero, one. Uh, if n is uh if, if the lowest bit is zero and the highest bit is one, then we're hoping to get one zero and we'll, we'll see if we get that, right? So we're going to have, okay, this bit's one and not the lowest bit, which we said was zero. Yeah, okay, so it's going to work out. So it's kind of a little quick sanity check to make sure that uh, makes sense. Um, and then we can go ahead and now I'm going to have to go turn that print statement back on. Uh, let's do that. 
and we can kind of see it going in, right? So what are we doing? We're looking at the inputs. So in this case, uh, you know, if we see a zero, uh, if there's nothing high, we're going to return a zero. But we said it's kind of almost like a don't care case. We don't really care too much what's going to happen in that case. Uh, if it's a one, then you know, okay. Uh, and remember, one's in the lowest bit position, but in the one hand, codes come out there. And of course, if we have uh, the next highest, it's going to be one zero, and then three with the priority encoding, the lowest bit's one, right? So that's going to win out. So it's not bit one that's winning out, it's the lowest bit. So my particular priority encoder is returning uh, a one hot output. Uh, cool. So that's using the, the gates approach. We could just as well uh, swap that for using the muxes. Um, and so with the muxes, oh, one more thing about the gates. Uh, let's talk about the base case, right? So the base case is uh, we want to uh, end in a one. We need something kind of pass in. So this expression is going to work. Anything n of one is that thing. So that's why that kind of works out. Um, now, if we uh, do with muxes, the mux one's a little simpler, right? We just need n muxes. So we have kind of a recursion here where we're going to instantiate these n muxes. And what do we do? Well, we instantiate, um, you know, we're looking at that bit individually. And if it's true, we're going to go ahead and return the one hot encoding of that thing shifted over, right? So, um, Bit zero is one shifted over zero times. You know, bit one is going to be shifted over one time, etc. So that's going to work out, and we're going to you know build that cascading chain of muxes going up. And at the end, we're going to filter into zero. Okay, so this one you know is also going to return the same result. And if we look at the uh, output, it's going to be a little different, right? If you look at the the Verilog. Um, oops. Uh, I like it better without that uh, extra stuff to print. Great. So uh, in this case, it's, it is a little different, right? You can see that uh, we're generating uh, these two-bit signals wherever we're actually, in this case, what our output width is directly. And either, you know, okay, based on the last bit, either if it's true, boom, one, right? If it's not true, then we're taking the output of the previous mux, which is controlled by the next bit, and either that's going to be, um, you know, two or zero. So yeah, that's uh, with muxes. And then of course, yeah, there's one built into chisel. It's probably like this, like the mux one. There it is. Uh, cool. Uh, uh, questions so far. It's going to be a linear number of gates. So the question was, yeah, how's it going to scale for with gates? It's going to be linear. Um, looking over my slide, I think the n minus one might be not needed. Let's watch if this breaks everything. <laughs> uh, I don't think it should. I think that should be totally fine. Uh, okay, let's go ahead and see what the output is. Oops. We need our printf. Great. And then I think I can remove that. That was a different way of setting things up. That shouldn't break stuff. Oh, it does. Uh, because, oh, I'm making an output is too big. Yeah, that's why that was there. Well, good thing I can undo. <laughs> and I forgot one more print. Great, okay. Okay, good thing I didn't change that. <laughs> um, sorry, great, uh, more questions. Cool. So yeah, so here we are, you know, playing around with, uh, you know, um, priority encoding. Like I said, it's going to be helpful for a few situations. It seems kind of a little crazy. You're thinking, like, oh my gosh, wait, like if I always have, uh, you know, a fixed uh, priority, like, does that mean something's going to potentially like starve, for example? Uh, yes. Yeah. I mean, you're saying with a priority encoding, you're saying this is a fixed priority. You're saying this thing always is going to win if it's true. Um, but there's, there are some times in design when you want that. Uh, and now we can make this bigger again. Maybe not too big. Okay, so uh, another component is something called uh, an arbiter, right? And you may see this in various places, right? And basically it's something that uh, arbitrates, that is decides who gets access to a scarce resource. So uh, for now, we're gonna deal with the case of arbiters of you know n number of inputs asking for one output. Uh, there could be other situations where you have arbitration where you have you know, some number of resources is greater than one, but that's going to be a little more complicated. But yeah, so if you have simultaneous requests for something, how do you choose who gets it if only one person can use it, right? Some sort of structural hazard, right? 
Now, the nice part is if you have an arbiter that's you know well designed, if there's only one request coming in, just grant it to that person. Even if that's not the selected policy you have in place, just give it to that person. Uh, but if you have more than one request, then you really need to have a policy about how you're going to choose who wins, right? So one way uh, is with fixed priority. Like we just saw with the priority encoder, you can even use a priority encoder within your arbiter to implement a fixed uh, priority. Uh, alternatively, maybe you can try and be a little bit more balanced and fair. Uh, and so maybe something like a round robin, right? And say, okay, well, of the winners, let's make sure that we're giving people uh, their own chances to run. Um, so like I said, and this is, it comes up a lot within the processor, right? We have a structural hazard where multiple uh, things want to use a resource. So for example, maybe your cache is only able to have one write port to the SRAM, and then you have data coming back from memory from the DRAM, and you also have the processor trying to update a single value. Who gets to use the cache? You might need an arbiter to decide that, right? And perhaps you're gonna decide, you know what, I wanna give a fixed you know, benefit or advantage to the response coming back from memory, which at first might seem counterintuitive. You're thinking, oh wait, well, isn't that, you know, so the processor? Well, it's coming back from memory. Presumably you asked for that as a processor. So you actually also want that data too. Additionally, uh, sometimes, you know, you may have a lot of bits coming from memory, right? You don't want to stop those. You don't want to put those in the, you know, in their flip flop, if you can avoid it, you might want to put those directly into memory. So not having to buffer that too much actually is another benefit. But that's just an example. But the bigger point is the point of showing that, you know, you have this notion of contested resource. How do you pick who wins? Um, an example we're gonna see at the end of today's lecture is if you have a network switch, right? Uh, things come in on the input ports, and if multiple input ports request the same output port, how do you handle that, right? You're going to need some sort of arbitration for that. Okay, so um, Chisel, once again, you know, handily provides these inside the util libraries. We don't need to write our own, but we're going to just as an exercise. Uh, and so how does it do these arbiters, right? So these arbiters use the decoupled interface, right? This thing is going to appear all over the place. Not only is it going to appear in the standard library components, it should also probably appear often in your components, right? It's a very helpful thing to use. And so what's it do? Well, if you look at these inputs coming into the arbiter, you know, when a input, you know, asserts, you know, makes that uh, valid signal one, they're saying, hey, I have a legitimate request because sometimes maybe they aren't making requests, right? They can mark it as valid as zero and saying, hey, I don't need it. And then the arbiter is going to look at the collection of, you know, valids coming in and it's going to decide based on its, you know, uh, arbitration logic, which person's going to get the grant, you know, who's going to get access to the resource. And they're going to get a one in response on their uh, ready uh, signal to indicate, yes, you, you made progress. And then that input is going to appear on the output. And this is also a decoupled interface, right? So depending on who's ever after this arbiter, perhaps who's ever here uh, isn't ready. Maybe they're saying, you know, I don't want to look at the output of this arbiter yet because I'm not ready yet. So they may have ready turned off over here, in which case, even though one of these inputs won, it's actually not going to get, a, get the ready signal on the input because it's not able to move forward. But when ready is one here and when these gets wins, yes, and see the ready appear over here and thus it'll be able to send uh, the data through. Um, and so, yeah, there's a, there's a few different arbiters. The uh, arbiter without any special stuff on its name uh, is a fixed priority arbiter. I'll sort of make it in a second, right? So uh, we start from least significant. So port zero wins, right? If port zero makes a request, doesn't matter if anybody else is making a request, it's going to win every time. Um, Likewise, there's an improvement version, which is the RR arbiter, which is short for round robin. And that's going to use a little bit of state. There's some, there's some registers in there. And it's going to track uh, who's won. And based on that, it's going to make sure there's some amount of sharing of the resource. It's not perfectly balanced, but it's definitely better in most cases. And the trivial examples we'll see later, it's going to do, do a pretty decent job. Um, and these two are going to handle like, the vast majority of cases. Uh, however, there may be a case we need a deferred arbiter, which is the locking or round robin arbiter. And so it's actually the round robin arbiter, but it has an additional parameter count. This is how long you hold the resource for. So normally, uh, arbiter, the top one, this is purely combinational. So no need for clockage or anything. The round robin arbiter is going to give you a result combinationally, but it's going to in update its internal state at the end of the clock edge and then give a new, potentially new uh, grant next cycle through you know, multiple requesters and it's rotating who's getting it. Uh, with the locking RR arbiter, it's going to keep the person who wins that grant for count cycles, right? So if you need something, you don't just want it for one cycle, you need it for multiple cycles. With the locking RR arbiter, you can set that parameter and say, yes, you're, when, when someone wins this, you know, tie-breaking procedure with the arbiter, they get to keep uh, that uh, grant for, you know, some number of cycles. And actually, if you peek under the hood of this implementation, you'll find that actually uh, the RR arbiter is a special case of locking arbiter with just count equal to one. Cool. So... Uh, 
how might we go about using uh, arbiters? Well, uh, let's go ahead and just demo it first. So here, let me do the zoom out again. Uh, there we go. And um, what do we have? So here I am using the uh, arbiter from Chisel Library. So I'm calling it the arb demo. Let's look at our inputs and outputs. So for inputs, like I said, the arbiter inputs are uh, decoupled and they're actually a vec, right? Because we want to have, you know, an arbitrary number of them. And, you know, remember this flip keyword, right? Where by default, the couple is kind of mostly going the output direction. You know, the valid signal and the bits are going the output direction, ready to come in the input direction. If you want to make this an input, we need to flip it. And there is a single output, right? And so how do we connect these? Well, you know, a single, we're going to instantiate an arbiter. And we're going to attach the output of the arbiter with this bolt connect to the output of our module. Great. This stuff down here is just making the printf easier for us to kind of reason about this. Um, and then uh, looking at the other portions, we can see, uh, for example, OK, for you know using a for loop here, for every one of the ports, we connect the input to the arbiter with the bolt connect. Great. Let's go ahead and just run this. So I guess it's actually sorry, it's still visible. Um, so let's talk about its output, right? So in this case, what I'm doing is I'm using one bit per requesting entity for their, uh, these are their, you know, valid signals. And then um, the question is, which one wins? And so the way we're tracking that is actually a little bit sneaky. What we're doing is we're putting in uh, the data value for these uh, decoupleds. We're putting that as the port number. So that way we can look at just the output of that port to get a sense for who won. Um, and uh, so initially we're telling all of them for they're valid, they're one, poking that for one. That's why we can see these requests are all one. And because this, you know, uh, arbiter, uh, you know, does, uh, you know, strict priority, um, zero always wins, right? So for example, what if I, you know, said, you know, what if maybe it was instead said, you know, P greater than zero, uh, we're going to see that, you know, now that lowest bit uh, request is no longer coming in. So now the winner, winner is one. Winner has the next, uh, you know, greatest precedence. Uh, and we're also tracking the validness of the output, right? If none of them, um, if none of them were there, we'd have an invalid output, right? There's nobody uh, actually driving this arbiter, and we can kind of play with this, right? Okay, what if you okay if we say, um, uh, you know, p uh, mod two is making arbitrary test cases here uh, is equal to zero and uh, cycle. Uh, you know, mod two uh, equals zero. We can kind of see who wins, right? Oops, that's the wrong. Great, we see who wins. Okay, so for example, um, when uh, you know, initially in cycle zero, we're only looking at you know bits zero and two sending requests, and while zero wins, then nothing else wins, right? So okay, that's, that's the case, right? Um, so you can kind of imagine various different scenarios. Let's go ahead and revert this back to all of them and now show the benefit of uh, round robin, right? So if I, you know, just put these two little letters here and make this a round robin arbiter and run this, uh, we're going to see that it rotates through who wins, right? So the request did not change, but cycle by cycle, it's giving everybody a chance. That's the round robin at work. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and... Uh, Mark this as a slide so it's going to stop having that annoyance we were just seeing a second ago. Uh, there we go. Um, so cool, right? And uh, it's intelligent, right? So for example, if we had this, you know, only for two, for example, two can just keep winning, right? That's totally fine. Um, that's acceptable. And let's try that complicated scenario again. I'm going to see if I can get the math right. Okay, so if... Uh, I think this is what I want. Not and I keep doing that. This is the one I wanted. Yeah, so this is a complicated sequence, but let's, let's work through it. So uh, this cycle, zero and two made a request. Two, one. Two, one, the arbitration. Uh, next cycle, we have a totally different set of requests, right? We have one and three requesting it. Three, one, the arbitration. Okay, and then we request zero and two again. Uh, but remember last time, two, one. So this time, uh, it's going to be smart enough to give it to zero. So zero gets their chance, right? And then um, what about uh, this last one? Uh, you know, 
yeah, well, it's the same case as here, but now this time one wins, right? So we're kind of giving everything a chance in these kind of rotated uh, permutations here. Cool. Um, all right, uh, we can go ahead and um, turn them all on again. Four, and then let's try the locking variant, right? And so let's say now the count is gonna be two, oops. I put that a little preemptively. It should be uh, there. Oops, and it's uh, locking our arbiter, not uh, locking at the end. Great. So now what we can see, we turn on all the requests, and because count is two, now it's going to hold it for two requests before it um, rotates, and it's going to then do the rotation. Um, so cool. So that's the built-in arbiter, which is pretty pretty nifty. Um, and you can imagine, depending on the scenario, you, maybe you can get by with one of these three, right? And then maybe for a certain application, you have a really important case where you can't get by with this and you have, you know, some ports have precedence, some ports don't have precedence, or some ports are round robin and some are precedence. You can imagine all sorts of combinations that may occur in a design. But these default ones are pretty good. And honestly, just the straight up arbiter works a lot of the time. And it's only if you're real concerned about, you know, a live lock, you need to use the round robin one. So cool. Uh, questions on the arbiters so far? Well, let's go ahead and try and make one of our own. Um, so uh, I'm going to split these into more slides. As I can tell already, even zoomed out, it's going to be too tight. <laughs> um, great, and make this bigger. Cool. Okay, so here's my arbiter, right? Okay, so number of input ports, some uh, bit width, and so yeah. Okay, we take a vector of input decoupled. Great. Now let's see what we're doing here. So this is some stuff I described earlier in the lecture. I said we're gonna do some stuff with for loops today that maybe would be cleaner with functional programming later. This is one of these examples. So what do we want to do? Well, eventually we're gonna want to use a priority encoder and then feed that into a mux to get what we want. Let's look at what went into that. Well, in order to do the priority encoding, what are we doing the priority encoding on? We actually want to do priority encoding not on the entire input signal, but only on the ready bit per port. So what we need to do is we need to kind of gather up all those ready bits per port. And so, um, sorry, there's valid bits per port. Sorry, we want to set all the ready bits to false. <laughs> And then for the one that wins, we're going to overwrite at the end. But that's a little detail. But for now, we want to collect up all the valid bits. I'm sorry, excuse me, all the valid bits, all the valid inputs from each port. And so what do I, how did I do that? In this case, using things we've already covered, I declared a wire of VEC. And we attach to it here, and then we're going to attach to it over here. Right? So we attach to both sides. Great. And so what do we do? Well, we simply go through every port. And we uh, you know, assign this VEC field of the wire based on what we got from the I.O. OK. And later on, we're actually going to want just the bits in the decoupled, not the entire decoupled thing. So we also have a you know similar thing for bits to kind of grab those out. OK, now what else is going on here? Uh, remember before when I described for these uh, priority encoders, there may be a scenario where all the bits are 0. Uh, you need to kind of detect that. So that's, that's this right here. So here we have a collection, which is uh, you know all of our valid bits for the inputs. We turn this into UN because that makes this next operation possible. This is one we've not covered, but it's on your chisel, chisel cheat sheet. It's been there since day one. This is referred to as an OR reduction. Or in other words, it's going to take all the bits in this number and combine them together with OR gates. So if you're familiar with uh, chisel, right, this is, well, not chisel, sorry, uh, Verilog. Uh, you know, this is that, you know, OR uh, equals uh, syntax um, where you can kind of combine things together. Um, and so that's cool. So what we're saying is, hey, are any of these valid signals high? If none of them are high, that's the only way this thing can become uh, zero, then we know that you know there's no way this is going to pan out. Um, OK, and so then uh, what are we doing this? Well, we're using this to set the output valid, right? So if at least one input valid is high, we're going to pick a winner. And that's going to become our output valid. Um, and great. And then, of course, we are taking our valid signals and feeding these into priority encoder, one hot. So now we have our chosen signals one hot, and it's often a good practice to perhaps take signals which you know are one hot and somehow mark the variable name so you can remember, remind yourself of what that is. Um, so we have our one hot signals, 
And then what we're going to do, we're going to go ahead and feed those into a MUX, which actually works on one hot input. So that's, there's another variant of MUX that does that. And we use that to select the right uh, bits field. Okay, great. So we, now we set our output bits field to the one that won the arbitration. The arbitration is being determined by those fixed priorities from the priority encoder. Uh, then there's one little uh, wrinkle. Oops. Uh, that's actually a bug. That should be in there. Um, and what happens? Well, so we need to set the ready bit to mark, hey, that one has been granted and it's ready, right? So the conditions that need to be occur for a input to be convinced that one the arbiter is, not only does it need to be granted and win out you know, the priority encoding, the output uh, ready signal needs to be high. Um, and uh, the, um, it has to be the one that's chosen. So here we're using io.out.fire. Remember, it's just going to look at io.out uh, ready and io.out valid, right? So io.valid we set here, which is, you know, only one of at least one of the inputs that we're making a request. And it's also based on ready, right? To make sure the other end is ready to receive the output from our arbiter. And if that's the case, then we'll go ahead and tell that single bit, hey, guess what? You won and you're going forward. Uh, a lot there. Uh, we can go ahead and redefine that. Cool. Maybe we'll pause on the side for this question before I go ahead and start instantiating and testing it. As a brief aside, uh, the normal VEC indexing, right, is with these binary, you know, uh, encodings. And so, for example, this one hot encoding was so handy, except for we totally got here, right? So in which case, then I chose to use the reverse uh, encoding to get it back out. Uh, hopefully, when you have a design, you can usually avoid doing too many uh, one hot in in conversions either direction. But sometimes it happens. You just, you just do it. Cool. So let's go ahead and try testing this. So now this one we need to zoom out. Um, so let's look at our demo. Um, like the one we saw a second ago with the chisel modules, this is the exact same thing. Just now it's my arbiter and it has uh, a little bit different port names, but otherwise it's behaving the same. There's some extra stuff to make the prints work out. So remember mine has a, you know, a fixed uh, precedence. So yeah, in this case, for example, uh, you know, one is the lowest one that's always going to win. Uh, you know, maybe we could even change this up. Um, Right, and you see, okay, yeah, only one's coming in, sure. And like before, you know, if we um, did all of them, we see we get the same result. So cool. So that's um, us making our own arbiter. And like I said, part of what we're doing these things, now we're starting to see modules where they're really quite parameterized, right? It's not just as simply parameterizing the number of bit widths, but we're actually parameterizing the number of ports. And for each port, we're actually doing stuff with them, right? We're actually kind of, you know, considering, okay, I need signals from these ports. And so... What we'll see next week is it's sometimes much nicer to kind of be able to uh, do things uh, directly with the functional programming techniques. But even still, there's already kind of a clear, you know, hopefully, uh, arguably a clear uh, benefit to doing things this way. You already see this is kind of more flexible. Um, if you're a system fairlog super expert, you might be able to do some of these things with a genvar, but eventually you'll start seeing things where it's just really hard to um, do what we're doing. Cool. Okay. So, oops, I didn't mean to delete that. Let's keep it going. So now let's put it all together. So we're making something called a crossbar. So this is a simple network component. The way a crossbar works, it has some number of inputs, some number of outputs. For today, I'm using num ins and num outs to be very explicit, but canonical naming would be n by m for n inputs going to m outputs. And notice these these ports are one directional, right? So normally, you kind of think of networks as being bidirectional. This could be bidirectional. We could, you know, have n and m equal each other, and we could put the outputs next to the inputs, and thus it is bidirectional. But for us, considering it right now, it's unidirectional. Uh, and so, yeah, we have some number of inputs, some number of outputs. All of our ports are decoupled, right? So that's really great for us in the network, because we can say, hey, you know, I have a legitimate packet I'm trying to send. And the other side can say, no, 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 I can't take it. Or, yes, I can. Please give it to me, right? So we can kind of have that communication with the coupled. Um, and they keep saying, you know, we're doing this about functional programming. That's going to be next week. I want to save an entire week for that. But otherwise, it's pretty cool. There's actually technically a small bug with the ready signals. And the solution to fix it without functional programming is like 15 lines. And so uh, I chose to omit it. So technically, this is slightly buggy, but I think it still conveys the concepts very, very well. So how are we going to do this? Well, if you have some number of outputs and some number of inputs, uh, where does the logic go? Well, really, we're kind of thinking of this in terms of controlling the contents of the outputs. And it's just all of these inputs vying for them, right? So 
Uh, a given input, you know, potentially could write to any output. So in this particular crossbar design, we have full connectivity. Uh, later, you can imagine if that's too expensive, maybe we could figure out a way to have some subset of connectivity and somehow uh, allocate that bandwidth. But for now, we have full connectivity. Um, okay, and then what else can we say about that? Well, um, so you can see each input potentially can send each output. And so then how do these outputs choose? Well, they're going to have their own arbiter. And so the arbiter is going to have multiple things coming in. And this is going to work out really smoothly because you're able to use these abstractions we've already built up, right? So these are decoupled coming into the inputs. The inputs to the arbiter are decoupled. Uh, if, for example, we wanted to add queuing, we could simply just you know, insert a queue between the uh, input and its outputs. And remember, uh, in these other wires, remember the queue also supports the couple. So that's you know, a very simple add-on that could work like that if you want to add queuing to the system. Um, so let's go, let's go through this, right? Uh, and you can see, for example, in the case of this network exam example, if we had only one output, then we have only one arbiter. And it's basically just like the arbiter demo we had just a minute ago. So in other words, this crossbar is really just kind of generalizing this arbiter case to having, you know, M or in this case, num outs uh, arbiters. Okay, so let's uh, define some stuff. So we're going to go ahead and start building up our world. So what do we need? Well, we're going to go ahead and start defining bundles and composing them. So for you know uh, as application, we're probably going to want a way to convey a message, right? So it's like a message bundle, and let's go ahead and have with an address and the data, kind of the payload, right? Okay, our payload is going to have you know length uh, bits, okay? And how do we make how, determine how big to make the address? Well, we can use the parameterizability and do our typical log to seal trick on the plus one. Great, so we have that set, and you know because of this you know annoying boilerplate and chisel, since we have a parameterized bundle that we extended. We just copy paste that boilerplate in here for clone type. Don't worry about that. <laughs> but great, so we have a message, right? So now it's a little bundle, which you know is the address, you know, some number of bits saying where it's going, and data, and we've appropriately sized both, right? And in particular, the address is sized to be able to perfectly accommodate the number of things we're addressing. Now, what's actually gonna be the IO for our crossbar module? And crossbar often is abbreviated as an X bar. Well, we have our number of inputs, number of outputs, and how long our you know messages are. And so what do we want? Well, we want uh, a vector of inputs, so we have a number of ins, and these are all incoming decoupled signals. Great, and what type are they? Well, they're that message type we made. Meanwhile, our outputs are the decoupled output message signals. Remember, decoupled by default is kind of like a, an output. So there we go. And so strictly speaking, right, not only do these vex and have multiple ports, right, because decoupled has wires in both directions, even though we call this in, right, there are wires in there, in particular, the, um, the ready wires are going in the opposite direction, right? Uh, and so we kind of seen this notion of things being input and outputs. We say in and out, but it's already kind of getting more generalized, right? It's kind of these things, but as we'll see in the next slide, because we're able to kind of compose these fractions nicely, it, we don't have to kind of worry too much about that. It's going to kind of clean up itself up. Cool. Okay, so we go ahead and we also have to do clone type again. Didn't break anything. Great. And now let's take a look at implementing it. So the implementation you can see uh, is not super long modulo this bug I described. Um, but what do we have? Well, uh, so we instantiate our I.O. In this case, because we pre-declared the I.O. elsewhere, we just instantiate that I.O. So it's nice and compact on the slide. And for every output, we're going to instantiate a module. We just, sorry, uh, an arbiter. We talked about that. OK. And then for every arbiter, we connect all of the inputs to all the inputs to the arbiter. Here I'm using the convention of, you know, OP for indexes over output ports and IP for indexing over input ports. So for every output port, make an arbiter, and then for every input port, uh, connect that to the arbiter, right? So this is going to be run, you know, uh, n times n iterations, right? All those connections, all connectivity is going to be there. And then for each uh, output port, we're connecting the output of the arbiter, of course, to its actual uh, output. And then um, for the sake of us uh, getting uh, some print statements, we also have uh, some extra stuff here. Um, and a warning, if anybody sees the slide later on and wondering why the crossbar not work, uh, there's a slight issue with ready. And I'm going to ask you folks, uh, what is the issue with ready or what, what's going wrong with ready? Um, so let's go ahead and peek at the Verilog. Uh, so it's going to be a little daunting. So here we're saying I want two inputs, two outputs by eight bits. Oh my gosh, what happened? Uh, well, remember, each of these ports is of quite a few fields, right? There is... Uh, ready and valid because of decoupled. 
And then because of the message bundle, there's also going to be, uh, you know, both a data and address, right? In particular, the way it gets flattened out, you see, for example, this first input, right? Okay, I only put zero, you get the ready, the valid, and then bits is the part. Remember, bits in this case is a bundle, so then we have both bits underscore address and bits underscore data for two inputs. Uh, there we go. And then um, this particular one, we should have more outputs maybe? Um, yeah, I'm surprised there's not more outputs. Uh, but you can see what's going on. So we have multiple <laughs> arbiter instantiations. Uh, wait, why? That's an interesting bug. Uh, next slide is going to work for the demo. Oh, there it is. Sorry, I didn't scroll down. There's, okay, there's IO out zero, IO is out zero, one. Okay, great. So you can see there's a whole set of outputs as well. And yeah, it really grows quite fast. There's a bunch of wires. We instantiate two different arbiters. The arbiter is also defined. There's a lot going on. Although this might seem daunting. Oh my gosh, I made this like most complicated hardware ever. You can see that for the most part, these things are just assignments, right? So these are things that, you know, a CAD tool is going to read and just, you know, replace automatically and it's going to cost you nothing. It's a zero cost abstraction, right? Um, and let's see if we can keep scrolling down. Oops. That might be the end of I can scroll. Let's go ahead and zoom out and see if we're not missing anything. It does keep going. Um, yeah, so there's, there's quite a bit there. Cool. Let's zoom back in for testing. Okay. So uh, for convenience sake, uh, I defined the number of inputs and about externally, so you can kind of change those all together. What are we doing? Well, we're in this case, for this artificial example, we're going to say, hey, let's try to send a message on every input port. Uh, and where are they going to send it? Well, we're going to do some sort of modulus based on the number of output ports. And to see what message one, we're going to put our sending uh, address on the data payload so that way you can kind of see who won. And by marking these valid, we're actually trying to send these requests. Um, meanwhile, to prevent you know any back pressure, we're going to say, hey, everybody's ready to receive another end of the crossbar. Let's go ahead and tick and see what happens, right? So. Um, go ahead and run this. So now it's a single uh, output. Oops, I on the prior slide, I commented out the printf. I keep doing that. Uh, great. Reevaluate. Reevaluate. Boom. Okay, yeah. So we saw, for example, even though we had four inputs, um, it's all... Um, the input one, uh, sorry, input zero keeps winning. So the input zero is sending a zero uh, to output port zero. So now, for example, if I say there's two output ports, let's see what happens. Well, uh, what we see is that uh, now each user represents one cycle. We see, okay, uh, zero sent one to input zero, sent one to output zero. Um, great, and also sent one to one. I might have put the wrong thing in the print statement. Let's go back a slide. So it probably should be one comma one. Yeah, okay. Uh, great. And then we have that set up. And cool. So we can keep, uh, you know, letting it grow and kind of let everything get sent. So uh, in particular, we're letting everything kind of get sent over. Uh, and great. So that's our crossbar operating. So now I'm going to go back to the question I posed uh, a minute or two ago. Oops, let's go here. Uh, so what is the bug with uh, dot ready? Does anyone have an idea? And this is one of these bugs that the compiler is not going to catch because uh, it's this is valid chisel. It's just logically wrong. There's a, there's a subtle error, but like I said, the fix is going to be more lines we want to fix uh, right today. Anybody have an idea? Well, okay, let's ask ourselves a question. Uh, what should be the ready signal for one of these incoming ports, right? Um, well, it should be one when they uh, got a chance to send their message, right? So they're trying to send a message and uh, in order to send a message, their message is actually being you know sent to all these arbiters and all these arbiters are considering it. Um, and so how are we gonna make sure it actually ends up in the right one? So, so the issue is, of course, that uh, with this loop, we are, even though we're connecting to a couple interfaces, we are overwriting prior arbiters, right? So if we go back a prior slide, oops, 
if you go back a prior slide, uh, you can see that uh, each of these input ports connects to multiple arbiters. So I'm going to bolt connect this to here, and then I'm going to bolt connect this to here, and that's going to overwrite it. So even though this end is fine, they're all getting their own copy, the other end, because the bolt connects bidirectional, it's connecting both sides, is overwriting it, it's clobbering it. So for example, we wouldn't know we were winning. So that's kind of a problem. So yeah, so that's something we're going to fix uh, for a recast version of this crossbar next week. Uh, when we get these functional programming, things are a little bit easier to express. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's the buggy crossbar, maybe, so to speak. But we're still kind of starting to see a little bit of flexibility possible with uh, Chisel. Uh, and on Friday, we'll also learn ways to make a little bit more uh, elegant testers with ready valid that aren't quite so cumbersome. Uh, with that, I think uh, I'm going to pause for any last questions. Yeah so, so, yeah, so it's clobbering, and the issue is, think about what the ready signal needs to be. The ready signal needs to be the OR of all of the ready signals from all of the arbiters, right? Because, um, you know, you, you're broadcasting your stuff to all the arbiters, and perhaps you're actually trying to send a request, so your valid is high, and that arbiter on the other end sees that and decides to grant you the, uh, the thing. You need to click, click that in. So basically, you want to have an OR reduction across all of the um, arbiter responses coming back to you. That's what that's it should be. And so to do that or reduction, I mean, we, we could do it. It'd just be like five lines. <laughs> or yeah, it's, it's not as compact. In functional program, we'll do some maps. It'll be very compact. I, I would probably put in uh, maybe elsewhere. It's one of these things where depending how you set it up, uh, you might find it easier to make a 2D uh, array of values and it kind of starts ballooning really quickly. <laughs> um, and so do be able to do or reduction right away. It kind of keeps it more compact. Um, but yeah, uh, maybe before I post these, I'll try and put in the bug fix. So that way, you know, for prosperity's sake, people won't be looking at a buggy crossbar. Uh, but this kind of still shows the idea, right? Putting in our crossbars, connecting them up. Normally, bull connects are great. Uh, but in this case, the issue is it's kind of clobbering uh, on the um, IO side, right? Where uh, we're connecting... Uh, to uh, this multiple times, right? So uh, another way of saying this, a certain IP value is going to appear only once in one you know, execution of this loop. However, it's going to appear OP times, or sorry, uh, num outs times in the entire program execution, right? And that's the problem, is that we're going to connect to io.in bi-directionally, uh, you know, num outs times. And so it's going to keep clobbering those inputs. The output is fine. You can keep connecting the outputs, no problem reading it, but the inputs is where we get in trouble. Great questions. Cool. Well, that's all. Uh, I did want to say one quick thing about the uh, homeworks. I've been talking to the TA. We had a little bit of advice. Let me get my note on that. Um, shoot. I just scrolled off the side. Oh, there it is. So uh, for homework this week, uh, there was a miscommunication between us. And so I believe on Gradescope, it lists the homework is due on Friday. Normally, it'll be due on Thursday. Because this one's are bad, we're not going to push the deadline forward. So this week, it's due Friday. <laughs> and I'll change the canvas to make that consistent. Um, but hopefully in future weeks, be expecting uh, homeworks to be due normally on Thursdays. Uh, and we, of course, are doing our best to try and help as we can on Slack. Uh, you know, we, of course, aren't there 24 hours a day. So, uh, you know, if it's helpful if you want to ask questions, if you ask maybe earlier in the day so we can help you. Um, or perhaps your classmates can help you, which would also be nice. Uh, and with that, uh, I think we're all good to go. And I'll sign off. Wish you all a good day. Oh, sorry. Jason's saying uh, he's doing office hours right now in this room. So... We need to update the webpage. Jason has office hours, phone lectures on Wednesdays. And uh, yes, he has office hours currently right now in this room. So I'm going to make him, uh, we already have a co-host, great. I'm going to make him host and sign off. But have a good day, folks. <laughs>